Good day, ladies and gentlemen, wherever you are. I am Zainab Usman, Director of the Africa Program at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace here in Washington, DC. Here at Carnegie Africa, we focus on the economic, the political, and the transnational issues that are shaping the African continent and that will have relevance for the continent's future. Today, we will be discussing Africa's changing role in the UK's foreign policy. This discussion highlights key messages from our recent publication on the topic. Now, before we start, let me give you some background information as to how and why we decided to do this analysis. In March 2021, the United Kingdom, uh, the UK's government published Global Britain in a Competitive Age, the Integrated Review of Security, Defense, Development and Foreign Policy. This document received extensive coverage from the international development community, which was highly critical and mostly negative. The major sticking points were the cuts in foreign aid and the decision to abolish uh, the Department for International Development, DFID, as an autonomous aid agency that had happened months prior in 2020, as well as uh, the shifting thematic focus of the UK's external relations with developing countries moving from poverty reduction to more explicit geopolitical objectives in these uh, relations, at least as articulated in the document. So, uh, you know, when uh, this, these discussions were happening at the time of the publication of the document, it seems to me that the implications for African countries of this UK foreign policy overhaul would extend far beyond this limited and intense focus on the retrenchment of foreign aid. Because here we have the United Kingdom, an important economy, an important country around the world, overhauling and integrating its development, its security, its defense and foreign policies shortly after Brexit, a decision of a generation for the country. Yet the overwhelming focus on what this policy shift means for developing countries, especially those in Africa, at the time of the publication of the document was centered primarily on the reduction in UK foreign aid spending from 0.7% of GNI to 0.5%. It also seemed to me at the time of the publication of this document and the, the, the discussions generated that this policy overhaul that we were seeing and we are seeing from the United Kingdom was happening at a very interesting geopolitical juncture for the world. The coronavirus pandemic was and still is accelerating major trends in digitalization, in trade and investment flows, all of which are taking the world to a new, potentially multipolar era. These geopolitical shifts have tangible outputs in African countries. I give you an example. Since 2009, China has become Africa's largest bilateral trade partner. But beyond China, other countries from India to Turkey to those in the Persian Gulf have become important investors and actors in Africa. And within the African countries themselves, very important shifts were and are happening. Already we know that for large economies on the continent, from Nigeria to South Africa, from Egypt to Kenya, for them, foreign aid in aggregate accounts for less than 5% of their GNI. In fact, Ghana in 2018 unveiled a Ghana Beyond Aid strategy to rethink sources of external finance and investment beyond foreign aid. And Kenya, as we know, has been very proactive in negotiating bilateral free trade agreements with advanced economies from the United States to the United Kingdom. Now, putting all of these together, it seemed to me that the laser sharp focus of many in the development community on mostly the foreign aid cuts coming from the UK in 2020 and in 2021 seemed to miss a lot of these very important shifts happening within the UK itself, within African countries and around the world. And indeed, the implications of these shifts for UK-Africa trade, UK-Africa investments, diaspora relations, etc., which could be very, very significant down the line. And don't forget that uh, there are 19 African countries uh, which are members of the Commonwealth, most being former British colonies, except perhaps for Mozambique and Rwanda. And the, there are 
uh, at least 1.4 million people born in Africa who live in the UK, making up 2% of uh, the UK population. So it is within this context that Jonathan Glennie and I decided to review the integrated review itself uh, from the UK using a more expansive lens beyond the foreign aid cuts and uh, uh, the, the abolishment of, of DFID. We conducted this analysis in the spirit of identifying risks and opportunities for African countries and other stakeholders and, for, um, and to suggest tangible policy recommendations. So I do invite you, our audience today, to read the full report entitled Sign of the Times, How the United Kingdom's Integrated Review Affects Relations with Africa, which is available online on our website at the Carnegie Endowments Africa Program. So today, we, what we will do in this discussion is that we will highlight uh, some of the key findings of this analysis um, and, and, and the relevance of these findings within the current geopolitical environment and how various stakeholders, particularly those in African countries or involved with African countries, can navigate this change in terrain of the UK's um, foreign policy. So I am very delighted to have with me here today a panel of brilliant experts. To begin with, my co-author, Jonathan Glennie, whose extensive experience in international aid traverses organizations like Save the Children, Overseas Development Institute, Christian Aid, among others. He's an author of several books on the future of aid and development cooperation, most recently, The Future of Aid, Global Public Investment. Jonathan will quickly highlight our publication's key findings. Then we'll also hear from um, and, uh, Dr. Nick Westcott, who's the director of the Royal African Society in London. He was formerly at the Foreign and Commonwealth Office or the then Foreign and Commonwealth Office. Uh, he was also British High Commissioner and Ambassador in several African countries. And he also worked at the EU in Brussels. And then finally, we have Mavis Ousu Gyamfi. She's the Executive uh, Vice President of the Africa Center for Economic Transformation. She previously worked at the then UK Department of International Development, where she led the creation and implementation of DFID's first private sector development strategy or strategies actually in a number of countries. So before I hand over to Jonathan, let me quickly walk you through how we are structuring this discussion today. So Jonathan is going to highlight the key messages of our report in the next maybe 12 minutes or so. Then I will turn to Mavis and Nick for their responses to the findings, and then we'll open for questions and answers. And actually to our audiences today, you can start by sending your questions already via the um, live chat feature in YouTube that you can see on the right hand of your screen. Uh, so Jonathan, I, I hand over to you. Amazing. Thank you very much, Zainab. Uh, I can't really, I usually say, can you hear me? But <laughs> I can't see anyone. So Zainab at least can hear me. Um, hi, lovely to meet you all. Uh, my name is Jonathan Glennie. Uh, I've been working on this kind of thing for a long, long time. So it was a great uh, opportunity to sit down with Zainab and do this work. And I guess the first thing um, to, to say is just to, 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 to highlight the title. We called it Sign of the Times. And that's what we think this report is. We don't overclaim for the importance of this particular piece of paper, this particular document that it's emer that's emerged. We think it is important, but because it's a sign of, 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 of the overall uh, direction that, that Britain is taking in the world and with regard to Africa, rather than because we think that every uh, civil servant in, in uh, government is going to be taking it down off the shelf every day to check whether their policies are in line, et cetera, et cetera, like that. We're not, we're, not, we're, not, we're not claiming that it's directive in that sense, but it's certainly a sign of what is and what, and what we think is to come. So let's, let's see the first slide, please. So we, we, we tried to, um, I guess, organize our presentation, our report, in two into blocks, right? And in, certainly in my mind, I had, you know, if I ever was privileged to be in a lift with Kenyatta or Buhari or Ramaphosa and I had three minutes, how would I kind of tell him what, what this new document says and what it, what it means for the relationship between Britain and Africa? And we came out with like three background, important background things, and then five important main findings of the document. So, so here they are. 
Next slide, please, Juliet. So the first one, I think, is, is, is to say it is the it is a sign of a new era for the UK's external relations. OK, this is not just another document. OK, and we think that this document, along with really the closure of DFID and the beginning of the FCDO, is as momentous a moment in the history of the UK's um, development, international development, architecture and thinking as the um, uh, uh, as, as when DFID was started in 1997 by the new Labour government. So that was a momentous moment in international development in the UK in 1997. And it led to for the next 10, 15 years, quite a significant change and important process of, 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 of the UK in the world and with Africa. The closing down of DFID, which is very much related to this document, this document is not a development document. It covers, uh, it's, it's intended to cover a variety of ministries, um, including the FCDO, but not limited to that. It's meant to cover the Ministry of Defence as well and the Home Office. Uh, the closing down of DFID in this document is a momentous moment for UK uh, uh, international development and relationship with Africa and needs to be regarded as such. So that's the first, I guess, context point to be made. Uh, next slide, please. The second one um, is, I guess, the broader political moment. It's related. Uh, it's the Brexit moment. It's the post-Brexit moment. Um, and Brexit means a lot of things for the UK, Europe and the rest of the world. Two, two, two of them, at least, are the and mo most specific for what we're talking about here are the um, positioning now or I guess with Ukraine, things are going to change. Um, but but the, the, the attempt of the British government to position Britain as, quote, global Britain, um, a, a narrative that Britain is going to kind of kind of take to the seas again and reach out to the various parts of the world that somehow the EU had been stopping it to do so. And therefore, this document emerges in that context. You know, how are we going to uh, uh, be different now because of Brexit? Um, and that's one of that's one of the pieces of context. And the other piece of context is slightly bigger than, you know, beyond the the, the Britain Brexit thing is, is 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 what Brexit says about the general vibe in the UK government and in the UK public. And that general vibe is considered to be one of internal, uh, not quite navel gazing, but a, na a nationalistic tinge, you know, less concerned as maybe it was under previous governments from Blair to Cameron about its position as a, as a kind of purveyor of good things in the world, whether it did that or not is highly debatable, but that's certainly the narrative that was told. And it's now much more a narrative of, well, let's, let's, it's Britain first. It's let's organise ourselves first. Um, and that, that's not new in the document that we reviewed, Zainab and I. It's, um, it was there in the document that George Osborne wrote a few years beforehand. And it was this beginning to put self-interest absolutely centrally and explicitly at the heart of development uh, thinking and other thinking, which was, which was definitely in play during the previous 15 years. Um, uh, and th th now it's definitely not. And then the third element, please, next slide, please. Uh, of context uh, within which this document emerges is the great power games, um, uh, which are uh, kind of renewed in our memory, in, in, in our minds at the moment with, with what's happening in Ukraine and the role of Russia. Uh, but when we were writing this, uh, some about, you know, we've been writing this, I guess, for about a year or eight months, uh, it was certainly, it was the, it was the, the, the news at the time was the US uh, and China. And that relationship, and clearly Russia was also a huge part of that as well. Um, and they're not the only uh, relevant powers. The EU is also a power, and Britain uh, would still like to be a power, and we can discuss that. But nevertheless, so that's the context, uh, the emerging multi multipolar world, uh, the end of the unipolar world, and that's and that's crucial to understand this document. Um, so now let's now, now let's take you through the five main points that I guess I would try to convey in that lift with an, with an African president. Um, and I'll try to go through them quite quickly um, because I don't want to take up too much time. So next slide, please. The first one is a strong focus in the document on liberal democracies and free markets. Um, you could, I guess, turn those around, liberal economy and free, uh, free societies. 
um, absolutely foundational throughout the document, constantly referred to. It is both, I think, and you know, everyone will have diff diff differences of opinion on this around this call, and I'm, I'm keen to hear what the panelists think and what others, uh, you know, think that are watching in. But in, in my view, these are things that are genuinely held beliefs of the governing party and of most of the uh, uh, British politicians, uh, which is, you know, that Britain is an important bastion of liberal democracy and relatively free markets. Um, it's also something that is used politically as a battering ram. Bo both of those things are true. And I don't think I've read a document. I mean, I don't, I don't think it's new. Some of this isn't new. But I don't think I've read a document in recent times that so much emphasizes it. And I think it will have implications for relationships with less powerful countries. I think when it comes to Saudi Arabia, there's always the example that's used or powerful countries, you know, there won't be so much talk of liberal democracies and free markets. But when it comes to relationships with, with the less powerful African countries, I would strongly expect, expect it to come to the fore. Um, and I think that's something that African governments need to prepare for. Um, next slide, please. That's the first one. The second, secondly, the explicit mention of military might. Um, you might expect this. This is not a development document, as I've said. It's not even a foreign office document. It is a Ministry of Defence document as well. So there is a hell of a lot of discussion of, of the UK's military might in, the, in, in Boris Johnson's personal um, uh, forward. He, he, he devotes a whole paragraph to the uh, intended new uh, aircraft carrier that, uh, that Britain's building. You might think that that is not that, that huge of a deal. Um, he thinks it is. I think he gets quite excited by those kind of um, things. But certainly in, in um, you know, in, in, in the discussion of Africa as well, um, the importance of security and conflict are high. And I think we can expect British interests, particularly in those parts of Africa that are relevant for security and conflict. That's explicit in the document. And, the, and, um, and uh, that seems to be the, uh, the shape of things to come. Next slide, please. Um, now, this is this is interesting. Um, and again, you know, the war in Ukraine may may be um, will affect this. But there's a clear um, direction. And this, I think, is new. Uh, a clear direction in the document towards what's called the Indo-Pacific tilt, uh, which is now kind of foreign office jargon. And it means less focus on other areas of the world. And they, they never say less focus. I mean, you never say less focus, right? But I mean, you know, given that given the energy and resources are limited, it, it will be less focus because it's more focus on the Indo-Pacific. Um, and that um, has been questioned by many, but it seems to be where this particular government wants to put its energy. I think a lot because of the, uh, the, the, the threat as, as, is, as it is considered of Chinese power. Um, and inevitably, that means there'll be less uh, interest in other parts of the world. I think Latin America has already seen that lack of interest. And I think it could well be that Africa um, uh, sees less interest as well with, 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 this, with this tilt. And again, you know, the focus on Europe now, I think, will be over, overwhelming. And therefore, Africa will, will be less of a focus. Now, many people on the African continent might consider that a huge blessing. Uh, others might consider that to be a concern. I think that's that's to be debated, but I think it's probably going to happen. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, fourthly, and all this is kind of leads to, and as Zainab said, we weren't we were trying not to limit our understanding to development, but this implies that that, that tilt and the other things we've been talking about implies a, a, a decreased focus on on development, but also crucially, um, an increased focus on global public goods such as climate, and that is an explicit focus of the report. It gets more, I would say, priority than poverty. Um, and the fact that many countries are, uh, quotes, graduating from ODA, including in Africa, and this is explicitly referenced in the document, the theory is that as, as countries graduate from graduate and basically get richer, then they will receive less aid. So the, so the document thinks about the fact that Africa will receive less um, aid in the future. And, the, and the, this is a common theme for the last decade or so with many countries that gradually it will become a relationship, more of sharing ideas, sharing experiences, uh, rather than sharing money. Um, and that, I think, is something that is clearly anticipated within the uh, UK's 
strategic thinking over the next few years and it's something clearly that African countries already know about and need to prepare for. It's something, by the way, that I'm actively working to challenge through this concept of global public investment. But I don't think I have time to really present it today, but uh, it's not something that we need to accept. It's something that the, the British government uh, clearly does accept. Next slide, please. And then the final thing is, I think this interesting one on uh, science and technology, is it new? I don't know. I haven't seen it emphasised as much in previous documents as I've seen it emphasised in this document. The British government clearly thinks that science and technology need to be an absolute central part of its, its offer to the world um, in a post-Brexit era, also in an era where, you know, quite apart from Brexit, the West is, is, has experienced economic downturns, is not quite sure how it's going to continue its economic dom dominance. Well, this, this document, I think, has it quite clear that science and, and technology is that, research, etc. cetera. And... Um, and there are opportunities there for Africa. Um, I, don't, I don't think we could think of that many uh, downsides uh, for Africa on this one. And and just um, and it, it, may, it may not have much relevance at all for Africa, to be honest, but it was a relevant thing to put into our analysis because it was such, um, uh, it, it kind of got such high profile for a particular sector uh, to get. So we thought we'd put that in there. And, and then we did look at the, the issue of uh migrants to the UK and whether this might be an opportunity uh, for, for migrants from Africa. That's it. Over to you, Zainab. Jonathan, for uh, uh, walking us through, um, you know, the context itself of the document and uh, um, the, the five major strategic directions that we identified in the document that we think will have relevance for the African continent. And through out all of those five, there are opportunities and of course there are also risks, you know, from decreasing the development engagement on one hand, but also an emphasis on uh, what are considered transnational challenges, climate change, uh, global health, uh, illicit um, uh, transnational crime and things like that. And also, of course, um, you know, the global talent visa initiatives that, uh, to, you know, where I would pro probably disagree with you slightly is that Actually, there are African countries and African individuals who have benefited from those um, uh, visa programs, right? The the, the tech talent, uh, you know, global uh, global talent uh, visa initiatives. So um, we'll just conclude very quickly with some of the policy recommendations we outline in the document that we think can help stakeholders in Africa, African countries, specifically African governments but also um, Africa's uh, development partners, whether multilaterals or philanthropies or even other bilateral partners for how to make sense of this new policy direction, foreign policy direction that we think the UK is taking and uh, in terms of navigating uh, uh, what that means for, for the African continent. Next slide. So the first thing we mention in the document is that um, it will be essential for stakeholders to try to influence the details of ongoing processes. So obviously this document is like a vision statement, but it's not quite a detailed blueprint. And our understanding is that uh, there are a number of uh, policy documents that are currently being prepared. So there's a development strategy, for example, that is meant to be uh, published sometime this year. There's an Africa specific strategy that is also meant to be published. These are all in the works. And it will be essential for stakeholders, whether governments, whether civil society, whether even individuals to try to engage with these processes. And uh, for smaller countries in particular, whether smaller countries in Africa or countries that are lower income, uh, which uh, perhaps cannot individually uh, make a lot of headway, they may want to work in groups uh, through regional entities, with the regional economic communities, for example. Uh, and, and, you know, there are specific areas where these countries can try to uh, 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 shape uh, and influence the details. So whether it's the science and technology focus that the UK has prioritized or uh, areas around high-skilled migration, uh, you know, the dis discussions going on around the global talent visa or climate change initiatives or even in, uh, illicit financial flows. So those would be perhaps important and promising areas to focus on. Next slide. 
then um, it will be essential to broadly think about specific risks and how they can be managed. So uh, the one that immediately comes to mind, obviously, which has received a lot of coverage, is that aid programs already have been cut, right? Aid programs in Africa, in the Middle East, in other parts of the world from the UK have been cut. You know, in Africa alone, just last year, I think, one al analysis put it at about 66% of aid programs or the funding has been cut, right? So that needs to be, government. more governments need to prepare for that more NGOs, more organizations need to be uh, uh, ready to manage the risks that come with that. But then there are also opportunities, and this is really what we thought we could do differently from a lot of what we've seen elsewhere, that, you know, look, this is the direction that the UK has set out for um, its external relations in this emerging multipolar era of a lot of uncertainty. So, but there are opportunities for some countries, for some stakeholders, um, and, and to harness these opportunities, it will be essential to leverage the UK's thematic priorities around climate change, global health, and all these other areas that have been explicitly outlined in the document and that you hear um, uh, uh, British uh, foreign policy officials highlight and emphasize. Then for larger African countries, which have the cloud and which can be able to make things happen individually, they may want to negotiate trade and investment agreements, but those that promote technology and knowledge sharing um, in certain areas. And we're already seeing, you know, countries like Kenya and Ghana, um, they are having discussions right now with the UK around uh, bilateral trade agreements. Um, so perhaps also making sure that these bilateral trade agreements do not kind of contradict what the continent is trying to do holistically with respect to the Africa continental free trade area might be something to think about. Then of course, we've already spoken about the Global Talent Visa Program and that the UK could, and actually it's already attracted top talent from Africa. Um, and, and perhaps this is an area where there can be more concerted effort from African countries to look at meaningful exchange programs that uh, ensure that, you know, uh, whilst uh, people have the individual choice to go and pursue opportunities around the world, that uh, you know, brain drain is also managed. So maybe meaningful exchange programs uh, could be something to think about leveraging this Global Talent Visa initiative. And African businesses can also potentially benefit from that. And of course, African civil society organizations uh, might be able to find uh, partnerships or forge partnerships with entities in the UK and the UK government, especially around civil uh, uh, rights, uh, civic rights and, uh, and democracy. Uh, next slide. And then uh, very quickly, I think maybe what I would want to highlight here is that, um, you know, as Jonathan mentioned, you know, throughout the document when we were doing this analysis, it was very clear to us that uh, there was a lot of emphasis on, uh, in some ways, a, a rhetoric around you know, a free market approach to economic management, to the organization of economies. And indeed, when it comes to negotiations that have been happening at the World Trade Organization around COVID-19 IP waivers, the TRIPS waivers around COVID-19, we've seen that the UK has a has kind of, um, you know, expressed this, 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 uh, uh, this willingness to continue with a, a free market approach even to uh, issues around COVID-19, uh, medicines, therapeutics, and vaccines. Um, so on this front, I think it might be very, very important for African countries that may want to take a slightly different approach when it comes to economic management to ensure that they are able to articulate clearly what their own priorities around economic development are, right? And on this front, working through regional organizations, regional economic communities in African countries, especially for the smaller ones, uh, for those that are lower income, might be essential. Uh, next slide. And then finally, uh, beyond African countries, um, other international partners of African countries, be they bilateral agencies, multilateral organizations, or even non-governmental ent entities and philanthropies um, are also making sense of uh, the UK's changing foreign policy, right? So on, on certain areas, 
they may want to compensate and adapt to or even complement shifting UK priorities, right? Thinking about the, the cuts in, in funding, uh, especially funding that goes to multilateral entities, you know, the diffid of the past funded or provided, provided funding to a lot of trust funded initiatives in places like the World Bank and other entities. So, you know, gaps would likely be left. Uh, whether other entities, whether philanthropies or other organizations can step in is something to think about. Um, maybe another thing I would want to highlight here is that, um, you know, what we're seeing coming from the UK, I suspect could be part of a bigger trend we see from other high income countries, especially given what has just happened in Ukraine. Uh, a lot of countries are suddenly rethinking their foreign policies, uh, they're suddenly rethinking uh, you know, uh, f uh, f uh, the, the, their budgets around defense, they're suddenly rethinking engagement with different parts of the world. So I think we may be seeing the beginning of a broader trend. And I think I'm going to stop here uh, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, the analysis itself and the key findings. So probably what I'll do now is I would like to call on uh, Nick Westcott to hear from him because he had a chance to read the analysis and, you know, he can also reflect given that he's currently in, in the UK. Thank you, Zainab. And thank you for this very timely report and uh, interesting presentation that you've gone, done. I like two things in particular about your report. Uh, firstly, that it digs behind the rhetoric and looks at, you know, what are the substantive changes that the integrated review uh, encompasses. And I thought your uh, summary of those five points, Jonathan, was rather clearer than the original review. That was very good. Secondly, it emphasizes the uh, agency of African states, as you just did in your policy recommendations, Zainab. It's not just what should British policy be towards Africa, but what should Africa's policy be towards Britain? And this is very relevant because talking to uh, many Africans over the last two or three years, a lot of them feel that Britain is becoming less and less relevant, less and less influential, um, rather fading from view in Africa. And there's a good question, does Britain care about this? Um, do Africans care about it? Or are we just drifting quietly apart? So thinking about your review, I'd like to focus on three big questions which we can take up in the discussion. Firstly, is the integrated review itself a good guide to what British policy towards Africa still is? And the answer is yes and no. In some ways, the, the integrated review is a very Panglossian document. It's all themes to all men and women. There's this wonderful passage on page 43 as to what the aid program will cover. And it will cover climate and biodiversity, global health security, open societies and conflict resolution, girls' education, humanitarian preparedness and response, especially food security and famine prevention, science and technology, trade and economic development. Everything's there. They want to do everything. Uh, but there's less money to do it with. And so the butter will be spread more thinly. And some of the ones uh, listed there will not get very much. So uh, in digging behind it, we have to look at what is actually happening in practice. Uh, and Ukraine crisis has exposed the hole that was identified at the time when it came out, the hole in the middle of the strategy, which is Europe. And there is no effective clear policy towards Europe. Uh, only a security one or NATO, which is relevant, but security is as much to do with political friendship and support and alliances as it is with military ones. And uh, interestingly, Liz Truss only a few days ago in the Financial Times reaffirmed the tilt to Asia as if nothing had happened. So my second question is, does the Ukraine crisis change Britain's policy towards Africa? And my answer is that it should do. The Ukraine crisis, if you, if you like, is the, the first major crunching crisis of a multipolar world. And uh, it's come in the form of a contest between an autocratic uh, way uh, of uh, running the world and that Mr. Putin thinks Ukraine should be part of Russia. And if the Ukrainians don't want that, well, he's going to make them. Uh, and the democratic side who say, no, the Ukrainians should be free to choose their own government and not be forced to become part of Russia. And that's a fairly fundamental 
division in the world, uh, and it has a huge impact on Africa. And certainly from Britain's point of view, they would hope that most Africans would side with a democratic approach, that sovereignty is key, uh, and that people should choose the government under which they put themselves, and they should not be forced uh, to do that by guns and tanks. Uh, secondly, it, it has profound economic consequences. It, it could spell the end of globalization and an integrated world economy. It becomes segregated, particularly if China really does back up uh, Russia. Then you know, Africa will be faced not with a single global economy, but a dual global economy. And uh, that will be very difficult for Africa. Does Britain have a view on that? Does Africa have a view on that? It also, the crisis exposes uh, one of the unrealities at the heart of the whole Brexit project, which is reflected in the integrated review, that you can have free move of movement of goods without the free movement of people. And that doesn't work. But uh, you see, even in the response to Ukrainian refugees, the government wants to keep as many of them out as possible. And uh, that is relevant to Africa as well. So while you would think this should be a no-brainer in terms of Africa's self-interest, that's not the way many Africans see it. And that affects, should affect Britain's policy. For many Africans, they say it's not our quarrel. Uh, we shouldn't choose between one side and the other. Russians have been our friends for many years. Uh, you saw nearly half African countries sitting on the fence by abstaining or uh, absenting themselves from the vote. And uh, you know that reflects quite a lot of public opinion. Should Britain care about this? Well, if they want support in the United Nations uh, to... Uh, persuade Russia they should stop uh, the invasion of Ukraine? Yes, absolutely. And that should be a fundamental driver of British policy. What does it mean? It means Britain has to be more credible in Africa. And this drifting apart, this, oh, you don't really care about us that much, uh, the cutting of aid, actually becomes a fundamental issue uh, in future division of power within the world. And, you know, Africans themselves need to think, OK, do we care about continuing our relationship with Britain if it starts costing, uh, if we choose uh, to sit on the fence rather than come down one side or the other? And the last time there was this kind of duality in the world uh, during the Cold War, Africa suffered. Uh, Africa's growth story only began when the Cold War ended and the Cold War brought conflict to Africa. Uh, so um, do people really think about that? Last question. Very briefly, what are the critical variables in this relationship? What will actually impact on it? And I see three, which you've, you've mentioned. The first is the migration and the African diaspora. And uh, Britons of African heritage, which is a slightly broader group than those just born in or coming from Africa, um, is large and it's becoming politically significant. And it has uh, increasingly a voice in domestic politics. And that is something British government is going to have to start listening to. Secondly, in terms of business, there is still a huge amount of British investment. OK, a lot of it is in extractives uh, and in financial services. But actually, fintech is a fast growing area. Pharma could be a very fast growing area, particularly if the government promotes its science and technology. Education is a, a big growing area. And though as British uh, sectors of the economy investing in that, wants to build a stronger relationship with Africa, and I think Africa would reciprocate. Thirdly, is the domestic politics here. We know where the present government comes from, uh, possibly where it's going to, but uh, would a change of government change policy towards Africa? And certainly on aid, the answer is yes, that's an explicit division. Uh, and therefore, Africa has an interest in what the outcome of British domestic political debate is going to be. But currently, who speaks for Africa in Britain in this government? It's very hard to find who. There is an African minister, but around the cabinet table, I don't think there are many loud voices uh, making Africa's case. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Nick, for, you know, those uh, three uh, initial questions on whether the document itself, the integrated review, is a good enough guide to uh, uh, the UK's 
policies with respect to, of course, the rest of the world, but also Africa. And then also these three critical variables you concluded uh, on, um, you know, migration, definitely investments, potential, I would say. The potential is there. Um, but unfortunately, a lot of FDI today to Africa is overwhelmingly in extractive industries, right? So the potential is there for fintech investments, for pharma investments as well. And then a crucial question, will a change of government in the UK lead to a change in policy, especially um, aid policy? Uh, it's, 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 it's also quite open, although you are quite clear that uh, it's going to be a yes. Um, I also look at uh, the, the economic performance of the UK, you know, inflation, rise in energy prices, and also just generally the, the, the sentiment, you know, in some quarters around, you know, the merits and merits of foreign aid. And, uh, you know, that is where I would slightly perhaps, uh, I would say I, dis I would disagree, but perhaps I see slightly differently that even a change of government might result in significant changes in policies, uh, but maybe some things might not change as easily as we might think. So that's uh, that's what I would say. Now, I would like to call on Mavis uh, to hear her, her own perspectives. Thank you. Thank you very much, Zainab. And thank you, Jonathan, for the overview. And Nick, for the very insightful analysis um, of the paper. I agree with Nick that it is a really good paper with some very salient recommendations. And it highlights some key issues for both the UK and its partners to focus on. But I, I want to take us back a bit. Um, and the fact that the UK aid landscape over the past decade has actually been shifting quite a lot. So we saw you know, the ending of budget support, which had a major impact on a number of African countries that had very strong relationships with Europe, had a very, with the UK in particular, had a major, um, major sections of the uh, human capital budget linked to budget support, were heavily dependent on UK's um, technical guidance and UK's strong voice in coordinating partners um, on the continent to really drive African agendas. We also saw the shift after budget support to finance in large UK organizations, be they civil society um, or consulting firms, to deliver in direct support on the continent. So we saw the shift from, um, you know, de-linking effective delivery um, of services on the continent in an untied aid agenda to what in all terms and purposes became tied but was never clearly articulated. We also saw the UK government shift a lot of its finance from a focus on the kind of systems reforms that were fundamental on the continent to direct delivery. So the focus on building health systems, supporting macroeconomic, helping to develop fiscal frameworks, monetary policy frameworks. These are the things that are critical for laying the foundations for long-term sustainable development. And we saw that that kind of technical advice reduce over the past decade. And then, of course, the to in and fro in of, you know, focus on issue X to issue Y and prioritizing and deprioritizing of um, countries. And let's be honest, amidst all of this, a lot of Africa's poorest countries were never really priorities in the broader aid agenda. So some of the smallest, poorest countries that were not ex-colonies did not receive as much funding as um, was envisaged in 1997 when we first talk about the great development agenda. But, um, you know, there were some excellent things that we saw with how UK's aid was deployed and development was supported development in most countries, especially in Sub-Saharan Africa. But in the last 10 years, this has shifted. So the recent cuts, whilst a major surprise to a number of people, 
and was unexpected, it wasn't really that surprising because we've been seeing this gradual shift in how UK engages in Africa. So what, what for me, the integrated review did was it explicitly stated the UK government's overall intentions in the medium term, which is placing Britain's needs at the heart of the global Britain agenda, as opposed to the original ambition of UK's international development agenda, which was focused very much on global good. So recognizing the interconnectivity of the world and recognizing that we've got to support a global good agenda. Now, whilst this shift was happening with UK aid, and I think as Zena rightly pointed out, we're talking about UK today, but it will be interesting to do similar analysis of other development partners. Whilst this was happening, the, the, the general aid financing landscape globally was shifting. And African countries have been forced to rethink you know, the sources of financing for their national development. We've seen a rapid increase in borrowing from capital markets. We've seen deepening relations with other global powers, China, India, Russia, uh, to name a few. And we've seen a rethinking of how they've engaged with traditional partners such as the UK. We are also seeing the consequences of some of this shifting. I mean, the decisions around financing, we're beginning to see the impact with um, the looming debt crisis simply because the foundations were not there to really ensure that the money was being spent in the most effective manner. But we are also seeing that a number of these countries have started to think about their financing plans and not being overly dependent on specific partners. It's a good thing, but the implementation of it has not been as robust as it could be. So they are thinking, I think when you talk to countries, it's less about how the UK aid landscape is changing and more about how do we utilize what is available to support our broader agenda. And the countries that are more advanced in this agenda are able to realize the agility you talk about in the paper more so than the uh, than we've seen in other countries. And so when we look at the integrated review and we look at the early views emerging from the forthcoming international development strategy, I do agree that Africa needs to really navigate its engagement with the UK in a different way and really think about how do we harness opportunities? How do we link these opportunities with opportunities from other partners, as well as private capital, as well as pension funds? So look beyond the narrow focus they've had in the, in the past and really think about the complex space they are navigating. So I see a few areas of opportunity. You know, the focus on climate and biodiversity. If African countries are strategic, there are opportunities to partner with the UK and really look at how UK support can support countries' adaptation plans. But it's not going to be offered. It has to be a negotiation. Countries need to understand the relationship they are navigating. I think the focus on science and technology is another great opportunity. You know, in an era of the fourth industrial revolution, given the continent's ambitions around vaccination, given the continent's ambition around industrial development, etc., there are real opportunities on partnerships for research and development. But Africa will need to push hard to have its scientists and researchers as much in the driving seat of these relationships and not just be mere recipients within this partnership. Otherwise, they will lose out. The focus on economic development and trade around investment opportunities. Again, having the right policy environment, being able to negotiate, being in the driving seat, looking at 
what is happening to regional value chains and where the opportunities are, rather than dealing with the UK on a country by country basis. Countries can actually look at their sub regions more widely across the regions, think through regional value chains and say, how can we not just be a recipient of support on economic development or a recipient of trade and be an end market? But how can we also build the kind of relationship that enables us to be competitive globally? The other issues emerging in the um, in the emerging strategy around girls' education, global health, no brainers. Um, if the money is available and there are real opportunities. Um, in terms of partnerships, again, issues that fit within most priorities for nation states on the continent right now. But I think it's not about, we, we as Africa, we are going to also have accept that there are certain things where we're not gonna make much traction in our dialogue with the UK. And the UK also has to accept that there are certain things that this direction of travel means they will have to reconsider or give up. So case in point, UK support to the poorest countries on the continent will be even more marginal than it has been thus far if we follow the rationale in the integrated review. The focus on the large countries. The focus on the large countries as trading partners is good, but the UK is one partner of many and increasingly in these large countries actually a smaller partner in those countries but they are sacrificing smaller countries with long relationships that they could really build strategic partnerships with so there is a lose-lose on both sides here but compounded by this is that poverty in the poorer countries the small poorer countries are fueling conflict which will have a knock-on effect on the partner countries that the UK wants to work with. So if you look at what is happening in the Sahel, what is happening in the Horn of Africa, it's affecting the Ghanas, the Nigerias, the Kenyas, the South Africans of this world that have been named in the integrated review. So there are risks to the UK in the strategy that it's adopting. It will also fuel economic migration to Europe, whether, whether you know, the UK likes it or not, it will fuel more economic migration and that migration will find its way back into the UK. So there is a tension on the ambition between um, putting Britain first and driving a global Britain agenda. The second thing is that we might not get clarity on how the UK wants to engage with the broader continent as opposed to the different countries it has named in the integrated review and continues to name in what we are seeing in the early draft of the international development strategy. But the UK should also not underestimate the response, the united response from Africa we saw around COVID and the fact that countries are working together in a much more collaborative way. So if the UK sees Africa as an end market and a trading partner, it really needs to also respect the direction of travel that Africa is taking around the continental free trade area, stronger sub-regional blocks, as well as a stronger AU in how countries work together. And on geopolitics, Nick has referenced this. Um, so just to emphasize, the UK might be under, you know, overestimating its power on the continent in driving this geopolitical debate and underestimating the power of silence and abstinence, as we recently saw on the Ukraine vote. I, I think that there is something here about global Britain really thinking through what a partnership with Africa looks like over and above what a partnership with Africa where Britain first sits at the heart of it. That's everything. Thank you, Zainab. Thank you very much for those um, very, I would say, thought provoking uh, comments, you know, first around um, how what we're seeing or some of the things we've identified in this analysis 
uh, especially around you know retrenchment of foreign aid and development assistance, are actually part of, as you say, a broader trend, right? In changes in the uh, uh, development finance landscape in the UK, but also globally. And then secondly, uh, that for some African countries, as at least those that are thinking strategically about their own foreign policies, foreign relations, uh, they are thinking less about changes in the UK aid landscape and more about um, how to make do with what is, right? As opposed to thinking about what should be. And then, you know, that uh, areas of opportunities you've identified, which we've also mirrored in the report, whether it's climate and biodiversity, science and technology, et cetera, uh, the, the best way to gain traction on that front from African countries would be to see these areas as areas where they could negotiate rather than areas where they could just be kind of passive recipients of uh, assistance. Uh, and then finally, that within the UK, potentially thinking about resolving this tension between putting a kind of Britain first and using that as kind of the bulwark for relations with Africa and realizing that African countries themselves are coming up increasingly with common Africa positions on certain areas and, uh, you know, uh, somehow they would need to meet uh, in the middle. So I'm aware we're uh, running out of time. I want to uh, bring in Jonathan uh, to find out or to hear from him what responses he has before we open up for questions. We'll take just a few because we're running out of time. Jonathan, want to come in? Yeah, I mean, you know, just just very briefly, I, I think one one of, one of my main kind of frustrations from all my professional career, and it's just kind of you know is is now forming itself into something positive. Is I, I think that there has been a lack of ambition in the. I think uh, maybe this was kind of get, I think possibly getting to this. Maybe you can't use this these terms, but I think a lack of ambition in terms of actually challenging the the, the current structures and systems and even theories that have been thought through, developed on international cooperation and development that have kind of been passed down to us as this current generation of, of I guess, development cooperation practitioners. And, you know, it, it's, it's difficult to know how much to work within and how much just to say, look, this is actually a quite an opportune moment to start tearing those apart and building something a bit more 21st century. And I think there is a great opportunity to do that at the moment. And, 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 and what Mavis said was, you know, don't let Britain, this is my, my words, don't let Britain or Europe or the US define what cooperation is for the 21st century and define what relationships will exist because we say so for the 21st century. It's an incredibly frustrating kind of approach that I think possibly too often other countries have accepted. And, you know, there's power and wealth, you know, and it's not, it's not often easy to counter those. But I think there is an opportunity, at least intellectually, and uh, by working together to be as, as as you know as powerful as as you know Africans have been always in the past. But there's a but there's a but there's a new opportunity now um, with the COVID situation, with the economic problems in the West, um, with the kind of the, the emergence of multipolarity and the kind of you know actually strength that that sometimes give to some of the less powerful countries in the world. Um, yeah. To 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 take the to, to to take the lead in insisting on what the future of cooperation looks like, and I think there is the opportunity, and I would encourage people to do it. Uh, wonderful. So let's. Uh, we got a couple of questions. I will just take one batch, and we can you know split the questions among ourselves, and then we conclude. Uh, let's see. So um, let me see. So here's one, uh, in view of the highlights uh, of the role of great power competition, is the UK looking to counter China, uh, you know, Chinese engagement in Africa in terms of investments and aid um, is one question. Uh, let's see. So then another question, and I don't know if any of us can answer this, um, is uh, will the UK be providing uh, financing uh, and financial support to uh, climate change initiatives in Africa? 
or will climate change initiatives also suffer from the aid cuts that we have seen? Um, then a third question is, uh, okay, so another question is around the uh, global talent, you know, high skilled migration generally. Uh, so whilst a lot of us on this panel think it's a good initiative, um, someone here is concerned that uh, it could lead to poaching African talent uh, away from these countries, right? So basically the brain drain argument. Um, so those are the three. Yeah, so those are the three. I, actually, there's a fourth one, which is an interesting one that is it fair to say that the current Africa-UK relationship, at least the direction, uh, favors more labor mobility than free flow of goods and services? That's um, a very interesting <laughs> one to think about. So let me start with Mavis. Do you want to address any of them? And then Nick and Jonathan, and then we conclude. So I'll, I'll take the point around um, brain drain. I don't think that things are as black and white as it was once upon a time. We are seeing a lot more fluidity in terms of movement of skills between um, the UK and Africa than I'd say we saw maybe in the 80s and 90s where you know you had a real brain drain. People migrated, they stayed, etc. I think when you're looking at the top level of skills, we're seeing more fluidity. A couple of things we need to think about. One is you don't want to deny an excellent African scientist from working in the global space because we are afraid of brain drain. But we need to create the kind of environment that enables them to look at issues around Africa as much as they can be part of a UK scientific venture. So we need to think of those skills in a slightly different way. The second thing is around institutional capacity building. If we can, in, in the negotiation around science and technology and R&D, if we can really push to see more investments in institutional development on the continent and real partnership, then we are more likely to see that continuity of movement between Europe, Britain, US, and Africa, the, and, and reduce the brain drain concern that we are all worried about. Great. Uh, Nick? Thanks very much. I'll just make uh, uh, four points in response to that. Firstly, the Chinese competition question. Um, it's interesting that it is Europe that has responded more significantly to this by setting up a rival to the funds for the BRA, the uh, BRI. Um, they call it the Global Gateway. And uh, there, there is explicit wish to provide the kind of investment that China has been doing. Um, I don't think the British government sees itself fundamentally in competition with China on the African continent at the moment, maybe now in competition with Russia, but not necessarily uh, at present with China. Africa needs all the investment it can get wherever it comes from. It's just, you know, African governments should be careful of the terms on which they're getting this support. Uh, secondly, I agree with a comment uh, you made earlier that aid should not be the be all and end all of the relationship was part of the problem in the past was that DFID was the ministry that uh, ran most policy on Africa, not the Foreign Office. And it's good to get a more strategic overview and the Ukraine crisis shows that it's essential we do that. Paradoxically, there's quite a good case to say we should reduce our aid and shift more into investments in our dealings with Africa, but they didn't make that case. They just wanted to show people they were cutting aid, and that was people on the domestic side. Whereas you could shift aid, exactly as Mavis said, into greater value-added areas where you're actually using less money, but having a bigger impact by changing the structures, changing the regulatory uh, capabilities, the capacity. Um, and that could be a much more effective way of giving less aid to more effect. Um, and thirdly, uh, on migration, um, it's a paradox. In some ways, you could accelerate African development by admitting more migrants to uh, Western Europe, because here they uh, work hard, they create value, 
they send back remittances they gather skills and then most of them want to go back and set up their businesses back home because the opportunities are much better there so uh, it would be a wise development policy move to admit more migrants from africa uh, and lastly on climate i agree britain should be putting its money where its mouth is and uh, the climate crisis as we we had a conference about this uh, last year um, climate conflict and demography and uh, the costs to everybody will be much higher if africa uh, cannot adapt uh, faster to the changing climate there and for that they need help thanks great uh jonathan any last words I think uh, um, uh, very quickly on uh, climate and aid. Yeah, I think there will be there is clearly in the document a shift towards climate from a poverty focus and uh, preparation, a continued preparation for the British public and for the African public for a reduction in uh, aid. Whether Africa benefits from an increased focus on climate, I don't know. Um, there will be the, 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 you know, the problem with some, some parts of the climate debate is that it, it's kind of less because it's less focused on poverty. It means that there'll be more countries vying for the, the investments. Um, and, then, and then finally, I mean, I kind of agree about um, aid not being the most important thing. Well, I definitely agree with that. But I don't agree that we should be allowing the um, wealthy, wealthy countries of this world off the hook. Okay, we need to spend aid a lot better. In fact, I think we need to transform it entirely and call it global public investment. You can read my book. Um, but what we shouldn't be doing is allowing the, the narrative that now these countries no longer require financial assistance because, quote, they're middle income or they've overcome a particular um, uh, uh, income line. Of course, it's great when countries do better, but they're still miles away from what anyone would expect of, a, I think, um, a decent and fair standard of living in the modern world. And as long as those disparities continue, we should be absolutely arguing for significant redistribution between countries in a new system, not in an aid system. Wonderful. Well, I think we have come to the end of our webinar and our discussion today. I would like to thank uh, Jonathan, uh, the co-author of this report. Uh, definitely, Mavis, uh, for joining us from South Africa, if I'm not uh, mistaken. And of course, uh, Nick for joining us from London for all those fantastic comments. And I hope we keep the conversation going because uh, things are changing and shifting very, very rapidly. Every day feels as if we're living through, you know, years moving very, very quickly, right? Developments happening at light speed. So we will uh, definitely try and uh, stay on top of these trends as they happen and try to think through the implications for um, African countries. Uh, well, thank you also to our audience for joining us from uh, around the world. Have a nice day, everyone. Thank you, Zainab. Thanks, everybody.